What I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to pick up on just a little bit of where we left off in our study in the uh, book of Acts, and we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so in the next few moments, I want to share a few scriptures, and we're going we're gonna to gather around the altar, and we're going to pray. John chapter 7 and verse 37, Jesus um, he's speaking at the Feast of Tabernacles, so that would be the feast that commemorates when Moses struck the rock and water came out, and it watered out of a rock in the desert, enough water that it gave water for all the livestock and two million people. So imagine that. We're talking a massive amount of water. We're not talking about a stream. We're not talking about a small river or a creek. We're talking about a massive amount of water just pushing out to water the nation of Israel. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In other words, the idea is that what he pours in us, and listen, nothing can come out of us unless he's put something in us. It's the basis for Jesus saying, freely you've received, freely give. You can't give what you don't have. This is why all of us need a fresh experience with the Holy Spirit, the time in the presence of God, filled full to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. So that the words of Jesus in John 7 and verse 37 and 38 literally become a reality because God has poured a gusher in, a gusher comes out. He has poured rivers in, rivers flow out of us. We're talking about rivers of boldness. We're talking about rivers of, of signs and wonders. We're talking about rivers of the Spirit's anointing, the Spirit's power to touch people. Jesus says this, he goes on to say, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When you and I are full of the Holy Spirit, it's like rivers of living water that come out of us. Again, what we're talking about is we're talking about a second work of the Spirit. Let me just, for the sake of clarity, make sure we're all on the same page. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, and anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So he lives in us as a believer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. He lives in you. He, he, you are a temple. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, he has people for his temple. He lives in us at salvation. But there is a second work of the Spirit where he comes upon us. As one man said, he is in me for my sake. He comes upon me for yours. He is in you as a believer for your sake. He's speaking to you. He's enlightening you. He is drawing you closer to Christ. He's magnifying Christ to you. All these things the Holy Spirit does. He's reminding you of the words of Christ. But he comes upon you for the sake of others that you might boldly witness to them, that you might pray for them with power. This then is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about. And every Christian needs it. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul says, this is a command, it's in the imperative, so it's a command, be filled with the Spirit. He's writing to Christians, not non-Christians. So it's a command for believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. On Sunday, we looked at Acts chapter 1, and while staying with them, he, that's Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, 
but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Here are the disciples. They know more about deliverance. They know more about healing. They know more about Jesus than any humans who have ever walked the earth. But with all that being said, with having been taught by the Son of God himself, having heard innumerable sermons, now seeing him resurrected, spending 40 days, and he's just pouring into them and pouring into them all that they're going to need to know. But knowledge is not enough. This is the problem in many quadrants of the church. People are satisfied with knowing. Yes, we should know, but knowledge is not enough. And knowledge can actually work against us. It can create a pride in people that causes them to rest secure in the fact they know and not press deeper to have the empowerment of God to take them beyond what they know. To take them on a journey. Again, we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now let me just give you uh, some of the things that happen when we're baptized in the Spirit. First of all, we saw power to witness, Acts 1, 8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The word we get our word, it's in the Greek, martus, we get our word martyrs from it. You'll be, you'll be empowered in such a way that you'd be willing to talk to anyone about Christ, even if it would cost you your life. I mean, this again is, I believe, a test for every single believer. Is your baptism with the Holy Spirit fresh? Are you willing to talk to anyone, anywhere, anytime about a living relationship with Jesus Christ? And if you're not, if there's places where you draw back, if there's people you're afraid of, if you won't talk to your neighbor, you won't talk to your friend, you won't talk to your family member, then you desperately need a refilling in the Holy Spirit, or maybe you've never been filled at all. Because when a person is full of the Holy Spirit, there is a power to witness. Number two, there's a power for boldness. Look at it in Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What's happening here? Peter and John, they've healed a lame man, and now the city is in an uproar. They've been speaking, been talking about Jesus. The religious leaders have come in and told them, listen, we don't want you to talk anymore in that name. And Peter says this to them. Peter, the guy who who just a short time ago was afraid of a servant girl at a campfire. Denied he knew Jesus. Not once, not twice, three times. This same Peter now is looking at the very people who ordered the death of Jesus and sought it from the Roman government. He knows they can kill him, but he says to them, you need to judge whether it's right for us to obey you or obey God. We're listening to God. They threaten them. They say, if you preach anymore in the name of Jesus, we will have you flogged. It would be a, that would be a devastating experience. Here's what they do. As soon as they hear that, they get together, they tell what's happened, and they pray, God, give us even more boldness. God, don't let us back down. Don't let us be afraid. Don't let us let up. Lord, give us the kind of boldness that even in the midst of this kind of threat, this kind of persecution, we'll be bold enough to tell people about Jesus. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Number three, we get power for miracles. We looked at that uh, Sunday, Acts 6, 8. Here's Stephen. Or Stephen. He's a, he is a deacon in the church, a man full of God's grace and power, that dunamis, that dynamite power. He did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Then you have Philip. He goes down to Samaria, and here's a magician who's been fooling the people. He himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles. Again, that word dunamis, power. The great signs, the mighty miracles, the miraculous power that he saw. What kind of miracles was he seeing? He saw the miraculous signs. 
with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So it's happening throughout that city of Samaria. Miracles. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, Acts 10, 38. He's anointed by how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, there is a power to pray effectively for people to be healed, for people to be delivered, for people to be set free. Now listen, I'm not saying that any believer, I don't want anybody to say, well, you know, I've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore I can't pray for people. Listen, anybody can pray and see God answer prayer. You say, well, then why do I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because your experience of praying with power will be significantly less without the Holy Spirit's empowerment than with his empowerment. It's a, it's a, a huge multiplier of God's empowerment on your life. Part of what it does is it, as you begin, I mean, it would be similar to what you saw tonight where we have words of knowledge, where God lets you know things you wouldn't know otherwise of what he wants to do in a place. And think of it, people online, people in this room, benefiting from that word of knowledge, being healed in the name of Jesus. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes us beyond ourselves into the realm of the supernatural where God is, is king and is directing us. Number four, power for wisdom. Acts chapter six, verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. When you're anointed by the Holy Spirit, he is going to give you a wisdom. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, in fact, um, it's very, very interesting that the first mention of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament, it's in the book of Exodus, and the first demonstration or uh, evidence of it was a wisdom given to Bezalel to design all of the furnishings in the tabernacle. That there's something about the Holy Spirit that, that as he comes upon us and he fills us, there is a wisdom that really takes us beyond our own ability to be able to understand things and, and to do things on our own we could not do. Again, it's this idea of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about the filling of the Spirit, the Greek word plerau, coming under the control, the domination. We're driven by the Spirit. He moves us in, in ways that we would not have imagined. Number five, power for divine appointments. Listen, the, the value of being full of the Holy Spirit is, and can you, again, can, can you have divine appointments without being filled with the Spirit? Yes, on a more limited basis. But why would you want to be on a limited basis if you could have, if you could exponentially know more of God's power? Because we know this exponentially, there are more people who need God's power and a demonstration of his power. But when you're full of the spirit, the spirit of God, you're going to hear him more quickly, more readily. Again, I'm not saying you're not going to hear him without it. You're just going to hear more. You're going to be led in a variety of ways. I look at this in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. This is Philip. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, uh, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and the spirit said to Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. You see, the spirit is always going to send us to people. He's always going to direct us to people. He tells Philip, Philip has every reason not to go up. He doesn't know that the man is reading the prophet Isaiah. The man is a foreign official. The man is a dignitary. Philip is an ordinary person. The man is 
African. Philip doesn't know that, that he has any interest in the things of Judaism, and Philip, being a Jew, typically would keep to himself. I mean, what happens is the Spirit of God takes you beyond your, your normal boundaries, the, the normal areas of your comfort zone, and he moves you. Philip has no reason to believe this official is going to want anything to do with him. But the Lord says, I want you to walk down the Gaza Road. So he's walking down the Gaza Road. Hey, there's that chariot. I want you to go up and stand right next to it. He does. And as he does, he hears what the eunuch is reading. You can read the story. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? Philip gets in there and he's reading the exact passage that's talking about Jesus in Isaiah. Yeah. Philip leads him to the Lord. The eunuch sees water and says, there's water. What, what would keep me from being baptized? <laughs> Philip says, if you believe, you can be baptized. And then watch what happens. Verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way. But Philip found himself in Azotus and he, as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I mean, it was just kind of like the old Star Trek, beam me up, only, only he didn't even have to ask to be beamed up. He just went up and he came down and he was in a whole different place. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, it'd be awesome. You know, when you're filled with the Spirit, the extraordinary happens yeah. regularly. Yeah. Your life becomes naturally supernatural because God is working in you. He is doing things in you. And it all begins with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm just telling you, I, I am passionately passionately concerned that people be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just think it's an opportunity right now to see God do things in you, through you, that you'd never imagine. We pray for that, and we need the equipment that he offers. We need what he provides. The Spirit of God lives in us for us. He comes upon us for others. And it's so exciting. You know, every one of us needs the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you've been filled, if I ask you, have you been filled with the Spirit? And you say yes. My next question to you is going to be, are you boldly witnessing and are you praying and seeing signs and wonders? And if not, I'm going to encourage you to be refilled. And then my, my question to those who have, who have, have you been filled? If you say no, I'm going to say, well, what have you done about that? You know, the apostles, as we talked on, on Sunday, they, they didn't just wait 15 minutes at the end of a service. You know, there are times people say, well, you know, I tried and it didn't happen. Well, you waited 15 minutes. A lot of people receive in that 15 minutes. Don't let that discourage you. You're not them. They're not you. God's doing a work in you. God wants, God wants you to receive that infilling of the Holy Spirit. And there are factors that figure into that. Part of it is what God is doing in you. Part of it is you stepping out and receiving it by faith. But the gift is for everyone. Donald G. He's one of the early pioneers in the Assemblies of God in Pentecost. He writes this about his experience. It is, I think, one of the greatest accounts uh, that I've read. In John 7, Jesus said, drink. Remember, if any man will drink, out of him will flow rivers of living water. That action is very simple, for we drink every day to quench our thirst. It is the first thing a newborn learns to do. Drinking does, however, require some action and effort on our part. Drinking is an act of the will. It is exactly the same in the spiritual sense. It seems so simple, and yet it marks the point where many stumble and fail to enter the spiritual experience for which their souls long. They expect their thirst to be quenched without their own act of drinking. You know, it's receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is very similar to receiving salvation. 
It's very similar to how all of our Christian life works. Paul says in Philippians, it is God who is work at work in you. Now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Is it God or is it me? It's both. It's you and I participating according to the will of the Father. It's you and I stepping out in faith. It's you and I taking hold. This is what he's saying. It's you drinking. At some point, you have to step out and take hold of it. The gift has already been promised and is therefore ours for the taking from the hand of him who loves to give good gifts to his children. We ought not to wrestle and work to receive the Holy Spirit. We may know believers who have come that way or may hear testimonies that run along that line, but the reason for the struggle resided somewhere in the recipients and not in the giver. Peter says it is receiving a gift. Nothing should be more simple and more wholly delightful than that. One more word to those seeking this blessing. Continue until you receive it. We cannot baptize ourselves. Neither can we do more than lead one another to the place of blessing. It is Jesus' glorious work to immerse us in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a real, definite, vivid experience. Do not be satisfied until you are satisfied. That's a good word. You just keep on asking, you just keep on asking, you just keep on asking. Again, I don't in any way want to diminish the faith of those who come tonight and you're saying, I believe God's going to fill me full of the Holy Spirit. We saw it today at noon. College students filled full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the, the room filled with people on their knees, people praying for one another. It was powerful. I mean, they're only two weeks into the semester and I'm like, oh my gosh, these, these people are, they're moving. So exciting. So some of you, I mean, just, I mean, Becky Davis said she went to lay her hand on a girl and, and I mean, instantly the girl was filled full of the Holy Spirit. She said, I, I was just so taken back. It was just like, boom. And then another girl and then uh, a guy and it just began to just move through the group. It's so exciting. And yet there are still some who are seeking. And I'm saying, keep on seeking. Listen, Peter and John, they didn't stop after one day. They didn't stop after two days. They didn't stop after three days. They didn't stop after four days. They didn't stop after a week. And I mean, they're exclusively waiting on the Lord to fill them. Why? Because Jesus said, you have to have this. So I'm just saying, wait on him till he gives it to you because he's going to give it to you. And I believe many are going to receive tonight. And then one more thing. I had no immediate manifestation, but went home supremely. This is his experience of receiving, but went home supremely happy having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith. Now listen, let's say that you come forward and you don't have the experience your neighbor has. What do you do? Do you go home dejected? Do you go home saying, well, it's not for me. It's not going to happen. That, that's not the attitude of faith. Listen to what he says. I had no immediate manifestation, but went home supremely happy. Having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith. What he said is, God, you said you're the baptizer. I've come to ask. I believe you're filling me full right now. The minute you start praying, God begins filling. I believe that. He begins filling and pouring into you. Watch. He says, I clearly realized, however, that the experience involved a scriptural manifestation of the Spirit as in the book of Acts. What's he talking about? The prayer language. I fully expected to speak in other tongues and had no thought of anything else. From that hour, my joy and gladness were intense until I hardly knew how to express myself in prayer and praise. The assurance that God had indeed fulfilled his promise to me gathered in certainty. I experienced a new fullness beyond words and found it increasingly difficult to adequately voice all the glory in my soul. This went on for about two weeks. He had this growing sense of God's doing something in me. God's filling me. God's working in me. And what did he do? Did he say, you know, I just don't understand why I haven't, no, that's not, he's like, wow, God is doing something in me. This is unbelievable. Until finally he was at a place where he said, you know what, I, I'm just so full. 
I, I mean, I can't, I don't know how to express. I don't know. I love the way one guy put it. He, he received just during Wednesday night, during the worship, and he said, I was so full of God, I didn't have room for anything else. It just, I just was so full. That's this. This went on for about two weeks, then one night when praying by my bedside before retiring and finding no English adequate to express the overflowing fullness of my soul, found beginning to utter words in a new tongue. I experienced spiritual ex ecstasy. I was taken up wholly with the Lord. Today, I really want to encourage you right now to order New Normal on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can pick up one for yourself, a friend, or a family member because God wants you to live in a land that's full of His promise and possibility. And we believe this book will help you on your journey to a new normal. We also have an amazing study guide available on Amazon so you can go through the book with a small group, your spouse, or even friends at a coffee shop so you can get the most out of this amazing resource. As you go throughout your day, this is our prayer for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. God bless.